Okay, uh, I guess we'll get started. Hi, my name is Tom Smith. I'm with Exposure Control Technologies out of uh, Cary, North Carolina. And I uh, appreciate everyone coming this morning and uh, hopefully you'll find this uh, session uh, interesting and maybe uh, if we have some questions, we'll have a few minutes at the end uh, for questions. But if you see something interesting during the uh, presentation, you're welcome to uh, uh, point that out at the moment as well. So uh, thank you very much to uh, the AABC and the commissioning group for uh, enabling me to speak today. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, this presentation was developed through work with the United States EPA and the Department of Energy, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. We had done a project for them in early 2000 where they had um, <clears throat> evaluated the laboratories in the EPA portfolio and identified uh, that the laboratory in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, used 48% of the energy for the entire uh, portfolio of buildings for EPA across the country. And it was supposed to be their green building, their, their energy efficient design, their main research laboratory. So they approached us. We had been doing the testing for uh, the fume hood testing for EPA across the country, and we wrote their ventilation standards. And so they were interested and um, how would they reduce the energy consumption in their research laboratory without impacting safety? And in fact, could they combine the two efforts and optimize the safety through an energy efficiency project? And so that's what I'm going to speak about primarily today. The, um, a little on my background, um, uh, I founded Exposure Control Technologies in 1994, and I had worked for the federal government as an industrial hygienist in the, uh, for National Institute of Health. And as I, was, I was a mechanical engineer, so working in the uh, Environmental Health and Safety Department was kind of an interesting position because I then served as a liaison between engineering, facilities maintenance, and the EHS department. And as a result, we began developing um, communication between these different groups, and so we've been helping facilities integrate these different groups so that projects can move forward more effectively. And so we developed this process that we call the lab ventilation optimization process. And so Lawrence Berkeley had us develop this and then do outreach program for facility managers, which we've done for government facilities and universities and pharmaceutical companies throughout North America. So this presentation kind of tells the story of the LVOP and some of the techniques that you could apply in your facilities um, in helping your customers and clients implement these energy reduction programs. So what I'd like to cover first is um, a little bit about uh, the laboratory safety and the risks. Uh, what we consider the demand for ventilation, and then uh, how to establish appropriate airflow specifications for the laboratories. You've probably been involved with lots of conversations about air change rates, air changes per hour. And I think if we could gather all of that time spent and, and capture the amount of money in that time spent talking about air change rates, we could probably power a few buildings. Nonetheless, um, once those specifications are developed, we then have to move toward commissioning and routine testing, and I think that's probably the area that's of most interest to you folks here today. And then finally, the lab ventilation optimization process. So when we talk to research facilities, we have um, uh, understood that their goal is really to create a high performance laboratory, and that's one that is uh, safe, it's compliant with all the codes and standards. They have to be dynamic. Uh, flexible because the research um, changes quite often. They're using lots of different materials, uh, different hazards. <clears throat> There's also <clears throat> a risk that these environments are not conducive to the type of research that they're doing and it would impact the science. And so we have to be very careful about maintaining the critical environment. And then energy efficiency. There's a risk that they're spending excess money and then there's of course the sustainability portion of it which includes the greenhouse gas emissions. So there's lots of uh, incentives for research facilities to implement these types of programs. One of the biggest factors is the potential for adverse health effects. We've done, uh, since I've been working in this industry for about 25 years, we've had uh, an opportunity to diagnose operational issues that have led to adverse health effects. And people have been exposed and suffered brain tumors and miscarriages and birth defects and liver damage and respiratory problems all from work within laboratories. And so we have to be very careful about how we assess the type of materials that they're working with and what the impact is on their potential health and safety. And so we have to look at then how do we design and operate and maintain these systems to protect people. 
So our primary objective then has to be lab safety and personnel protection. And so when we look into laboratories, we see lots of different types of devices. There's fume hoods, which come in lots of different shapes and sizes. We have biological safety cabinets, glove boxes, ventilated balance enclosures. In fact, there's about 700 different types of exposure control devices that are typically employed in laboratories. And so all of those have to be evaluated. They have to be assigned appropriate airflow specifications. They have to be tested, and not only on a commissioning basis, but on a routine, ongoing basis. So if we look at a researcher in that laboratory, he's got lots of hoods to choose from. They have to be appropriate for the type of work that they're doing. So the hood provides primary containment, and the laboratory environment provides secondary containment. So the idea is that what escapes the hood would stay within the laboratory. If they had a spill or something like that outside of the hood, it would stay within the laboratory environment and not migrate to non-laboratory spaces. Of course, we do that by creating an exhaust flow through the hoods, creating a negative pressure in the laboratory, isolating that space, and then because we're exhausting air, we have to create makeup air. And then we want to make sure that the exhaust does not get re-entrained into the air supply. About 5% of the systems out there will suffer some form of re-entrainment. And that's a very insidious problem because that's the kind of what creates that my chemical, my building smells or something like that. And so that's where these high doses of concentrations come from. So we have to make sure that these systems perform properly. And if we ensure their proper performance, we're going to comply with the standards. But we know that the operational systems are very costly. In fact, it's about 60% of the utility costs are associated with the operation of ventilation systems. And if we look at that on a cost per CFM basis, it can be anywhere from $3 to $9 per CFM. That's the typical range, depending on where you're located in the country, the efficiency of the systems, the energy rates, and so forth. So there's a number of factors, but it's a convenient metric to use. And in North Carolina, where we are, we're about $4.50 to $5 per CFM year. So it makes the math simple. You have a fume hood exhausting 1,000 CFM. It's going to cost about $5,000 a year to operate. So we can easily do the metrics and kind of add up some of the costs just to kind of get a ballpark on what they're spending for energy. Well, we know that laboratory hoods are the primary means of protecting people, so we have to focus on that first. Using the ASHRAE 110 test, we have developed a test system, and this was part of a master's project that I did uh, back in the early, uh, well, I guess it was the late 80s, where we used uh, face velocity to measure the inflow velocity through the plane of the sash. We measured cross drafts to make sure that we're minimizing the room air currents and the impact on containment. Then we generate a tracer gas through an ejector, use a mannequin to simulate a person, pull these breathing zone samples to a, a detector, and that allows us to measure concentrations escaping the hood at about 10 parts per billion. So if there are issues influencing the containment capabilities, we're able to identify and uh, resolve what factors are causing the poor performance. All of this information then goes into a database. And we use that database to evaluate and identify the factors that influence performance and also look at the different hoods and how they perform. So since about 1985, we've conducted about 30,000 ASHRAE 110 tests on hoods throughout North America. And what we've identified is that approximately 15 to 30 percent of hoods in a typical facility will fail to provide adequate tracer gas containment. And the factors that are associated with that failure is primarily due to the hood design, typically 20 percent. The lab design and the operation of systems can be accounted for about 55 percent of those failures. And then work practices accounts for another 25%. So Gerhard Knudsen, who was the um, uh, gentleman that invented the ASHRAE 110, uh, Dr. Knudsen says you can idiot-proof the system, but you can't PhD-proof it. Right. So we have to take into account that any solution that we provide has to be holistic. It has to look at the entire system. It can't just be the hood. It can't be just the air balance. It has to be the entire system that we're looking at. Now, some of the things we have to be aware of are the operational capabilities and limitations of these devices. Now, this is a facility, and in fact, it was right here in Las Vegas. I took this picture a number of years ago, and on the left it says, caution, do not use acid during windy conditions. And the right sign says, electrical hazard during rain or high humidity. So as long as you understand what's going on in the ambient, you know whether you can work in your hood or not. And I thought, well, that's a little too much uh, responsibility for the users. So maybe we can look at another solution. 
Well, tying into the safety issue is the energy issue, and these are tied directly. And so we understand through benchmarking of buildings with Lawrence Berkeley National Labs and the labs of the 21st century, I2SL, that labs are one of the highest energy users by building type. And a typical laboratory will be $7 per square foot on average. A specialty lab, clean rooms, vivariums, uh, BSL 3 and 4 labs can go $15, $25, $35 a square foot. Recently in Boston, we were looking at a BSL 3 laboratory that was $75 a square foot in terms of operating costs. It's unbelievable. That's the highest. That set my record. So when we look at <coughs> HVAC being the primary user of the energy, 60%, if we're going to help facilities reduce their energy consumption, HVAC is where we're going to find the largest potential impact. In fact, what we find is that buildings have on average 30 to 50% of the energy is wasted by the HVAC systems in a proper and inefficient and ineffective operation. And so our, our role then can go in to help these facilities implement this process and basically improve the effectiveness and the efficiency of the systems. To help in that end, the ANSI Z9.5, American National Standard for Lab Ventilation, was published in 2012. I was the chairman of the AIHA Z9 committee that was in charge of publishing this standard. And so we have 14 standards that relate to ventilation for health and safety. This particular standard is specific to laboratory ventilation. So if you're not familiar with it, I highly recommend you getting a copy of it. It, it contains the minimum requirements for operating laboratories. And it provides guidelines and recommendations for hood design, for lab design, for commissioning and routine testing, for work practices and training, and for preventative maintenance. It also not only provides requirements for safety, but it also require, it includes recommendations for improving energy efficiency. So there's a lot of good information in this document, um, and a number of folks from your organization actually participated in the development of this, of this uh, standard. One of the key factors that we derive from the standard is that uh, there is a need for ventilation, and we call that the demand for ventilation. And so ultimately what we'd like to find is the minimum flow and then that range of modulation necessary to meet the functional requirements of lab spaces. And we can establish those functional requirements based on safety, what are the exhaust requirements for the hoods, what's required for lab pressurization and isolation through transfer air volumes, and what's required from a dilution standpoint in terms of air changes per hour. You look at comfort and productivity, temperature and humidity control within the spaces, very critical for labs, and then finally occupancy and utilization. How do we modulate these systems to meet the demand? So when people are not working in the laboratory, we can reduce the flow and thus save energy. So looking at many different types of laboratory hoods, you have hoods that are three foot in width, up to 20 foot in width. They have two sides, single sides. They have double vertical sashes, single vertical sashes, horizontal combination sashes. Each of these different hood types requires different testing methods. If you look at a hood here, you have a vertical sliding sash and horizontal, so now you've got three different configurations to evaluate that hood. In a hood like this, which is a, a floor-mounted hood, we used to call it a walk-in hood. It's got two vertical sliding sashes with horizontal panels within those vertical rising sashes. So now if you said, how would I test that hood? You've got a lot of permutations and combinations of openings that the user could configure in order to operate. And you have to be able to tell that user, this is the unsafe mode, and here's the safe way to operate that hood. And then you've got double vertical sashes like this, where one of these sashes could be 100% open, one of the, both sashes could be 50% open or 100% open. So you've got lots, again, combinations that you'd want to test under. So we have to have some specifications. And we look at what are the opening configurations that are possible. When you look at the hood, you've got the plane of the sash. That's de defined as the exterior surface of the outermost glass panel. And that defines the plane of the sash. And from there, all your measurements are then taken. And inside the hood, as the Containments start to generate, they'll go into the baffle and then be exhausted to the duct, but at the top there's this vortex that forms and high concentrations of uh, contaminants can accumulate in that area. So to prevent escape, we have to first decide what is the opening configuration? Will the users operate it with 100% open? Will there be some design opening like 18 inches? Or will the user operate it at some configuration that enables them to be productive? 
At that opening configuration, what's the face velocity required to achieve containment? So we talk about an average face velocity of 100 feet per minute is typical, and that's required for a traditional fume hood. Your high performance hoods should operate as velocities as low as 60 feet per minute in the full open sash configuration. And so it's been demonstrated that a high performance hood can easily provide equivalent containment and performance to a traditional hood, but it incorporates more advanced aerodynamics. Then we have the circumstances whether it's going to be constant volume or variable volume. If it's variable volume, what's the flow when the sash is closed? What's the flow in the unoccupied mode? How low can you go before you introduce a problem with containment, with dilution, and with this, um, <clears throat> potential for explosion? So looking at our two different types of hoods, primarily we have the vertical sash opening, which allows translation from left to right. And then you have the horizontal sash, which allows your ability to reach in and access top at the top of the hood. Both of these sash configurations will operate effectively and provide containment, but you have to ensure that you have the appropriate operating specifications. To test the hoods, there's been many different protocols. The first that really drives it is the Ashtray 110. The current standard is the 1995 version. The committee has been reformed to develop a new standard, which is going to be the 2014 standard. And so we are very close. We went through public review on the standard. I'm on the committee, and it's, um, we're doing the final edits after the public review comments. Hopefully at this June's um, ASHRAE conference, we should be very, very close to putting out a final um, uh, standard. So we're hoping to publish this year. Derived from that standard were more uh, detailed protocols. The EPA, the NIH protocol, the Public Works and Government Services in Canada has a very effective protocol. What these, all of these tests share in common is that there are three ways to conduct a test. There are um, as manufactured, kind of a product validation testing, maybe during a mock-up test. Then there's the commissioning tests, which are done as installed, before the users uh, occupy the laboratory. And then there are routine performance tests, which are conducted as used, after the apparatus has been installed in the, in the hoods. So when we look at commissioning tests, not only do we have to evaluate the performance of the hood, but we also have to look at the lab environment. And what are the impacts of the lab environment on the performance of the hood? And then we have to look at the system. And we call that the system operating mode test. So you may have different operating modes, sash closed, lower flow, sash open, higher flow. And we have to test that hood and its containment capabilities over that whole range of flow modulation. So looking at more detail into the fume hood test with, with regard to ASHRAE 110. So we're going to test a hood, and we have our test equipment. We're going to start first with a hood lab inspection. We want to make sure that the hood is operating in an environment that's conducive to its operation. So the ceiling tiles are installed, the diffusers are properly balanced, the air is balanced. Then we conduct face velocity measurements, we do cross-draft velocity measurements, and then test the VAV response and stability. And I'll show each one of these tests in a little more detail in a moment. Those are the tests that define the operating conditions. Then we want to know, under those set of operating conditions, how well does it perform? How well does it contain? And so we have a qualitative test, smoke visualization, where we'll qualitatively or subjectively evaluate containment. Visual limitations there are about 100 to uh, 200 parts per million. Then you have a more quantitative tracer gas test, which you can measure in subparts per billion. Right? So they, you get about 1,000 times more or greater sensitivity with a quantitative tracer gas test than you do with a visual observation. I can tell you from having experienced lots of manufacturer's tests, that the manufacturer's judgment of smoke containment is significantly different than my judgment of smoke containment. <clears throat> now, we, um, in the survey and the inspection of the hood, we want to make sure that we look at the airfoil sill, the sash, the baffles, are they properly installed? Are the interior access panels installed? Is there a monitor on the hood? Is the bypass functional? And so once we know that the hood integrity is sound, then we can actually begin to test. We typically start with a cross-draft test. If you imagine 100 feet per minute going into the hood, and you translate that to miles per hour, that's about 1.2 miles per hour. So it's not a very high velocity to overcome room air currents. And so a diffuser that's typically installed in the ceiling has a terminal supply velocity of what, how much? What's a typical 
terminal velocity from a diffuser. There you go, 500 feet per minute. So you could imagine that 500 feet per minute blowing across the face of a hood at 100 feet per minute is going to cause a lot of turbulence and actually cause escape. And so we want the cross drafts to be no greater than 50% of the average face velocity. So we have to measure it first. And if the diffusers are too close to the hood or they're balanced so that the distribution of the air through those diffusers is too high, located a diffuser too close to the hood, we want to redistribute it. So we do that by taking an anemometer, and we measure the velocity outside of the hood, typically 18 inches from the plane of the sash, and measure the vertical, horizontal, and perpendicular components of that velocity. If you use an omnidirectional probe, you can measure all those directions simultaneously. With that, we can determine what are the sources of the drafts, what's the magnitude, and how would we minimize the impact of that draft. So there's no reason to proceed with the face velocity test because the cross drafts are going to bias those measurements. They're going to increase the turbulence and they're going to actually add. So your, your measurement of face velocity will be greater with a high cross draft than if it were in the absence of that draft. That's a lot of times what causes problems when you go to convert the measured average face velocity multiplied by the area of the opening to compare that to your pitot traverse. That introduces a lot of error. And so a lot of times the error is associated with the cross drafts, not necessarily the methodology or the people conducting the test. In doing the test, <clears throat> you divide the opening up into equal area grids, not more than one square foot on a side, place the probe mounted on a stand at the center of each grid, and we recommend that you collect 10 to 20 readings at each grid location. And so you move them from, say, the top left to the bottom right, and then you get a, an opening traverse that allows you to evaluate the spatial variation, top to bottom, left to right, and then the temporal variation, which is the variation at any one location. And that's an indicator of turbulence. So mounting the probe on a stand allows you to provide predictability and rely or dependability in the measurements. What we'll typically see when we do this is that A1 would be in the top left, E3 in the bottom right in this particular example. And if you were to look at the velocities in any of those grid locations, you're going to see turbulence. You're going to see those velocities fluctuating up and down. The degree of that turbulence, the turbulence intensity, is going to be an indicator of how well that hood will contain. And so not only do we have to look at the variability of that velocity, but we have to look at its spatial distribution across the opening in order to provide an effective containment. So if you're looking at this on an analog gauge, you'd see it back and forth, back and forth, and you would have to interpret that by eye, interpolate that by eye and say, hmm, I think it's 100 feet per minute. And what happens, and what I found, in my technicians doing the tests, particularly if they have a digital gauge, is that looking at those readings and saying, I don't want this hood to fail because that's going to create additional problems. So there's what I call optimistic bias. Right? I know the velocity specification is 100 feet per minute, and I saw that go by a couple of times there, and it looked like the 100 feet per minute was about where it was. Click the button, 100 feet per minute. So by recording them over time, this makes it independent of the technician. And it gives you the ability to reproduce this data in a, in a more uh, replicable fashion. By taking this data over time and looking at the distribution, we can determine the overall average, the maximum, and the minimum. And then the question is, is that range of variation too great? Will that cause escape from the hood? But it also allows us to define those operating conditions for subsequent tests. So now we can come back next year and take a look at it and see if it's the same. We use that data to calibrate the flow monitor. Every hood is required by OSHA to have a fume hood monitor. Now, it doesn't say what that monitor should monitor. It just says that it has to provide an indication of proper flow through the hood. So we have face velocity monitors. We have flow monitors, pressure monitors. Then we get into the VAV controls. We have through the wall velocity sensing. We have sash position sensing that senses the position of the sash, occupancy sensing. And then there's the manual control low, high, on, off type of switches. Then we have different VAV modes of operation. Two state, it's the simplest operating mode, occupied, unoccupied, sash open, sash closed, to your more sophisticated, more complex modes, which we call the hybrid VAV, which during the day it may modulate on sash position, but at night it might have a setback mode. And so each of these variations in the, uh, the mode of operation create additional complexities, a greater need to test it, a greater need for the commissioning of those hoods. So looking at our control, <clears throat> when
When the sash is open, face velocity times the area of the opening equals flow. Q equals VA. I'm sure we've all done that a thousand or tens of thousands of times. We can operate that hood between 60 and 100 feet per minute, but when we close the sash, we expect it to go to some lower flow. And the question is, what is that minimum flow when the sash is closed? How low can we go? And what drives that decision? We have issues with containment, we have issues with dilution, and can we remove the contaminants from the hood? So the anticipation is if they close the hood, they may still be generating materials inside that hood. And we want the hood to be able to contain, we want it to dilute those materials so that we don't approach an explosion, and we want to be able to effectively remove them from the hood so we don't get premature degradation on the interior of the hood and the controls. So the Z95 standard said, it used to be 2004 NFPA 45 said 25 CFM per square foot of work surface. But nobody ever defined the work surface. So it was vague. So you had all kinds of differences in specifications. The 2012 Z95 said, well, wait a minute, we shouldn't be talking about work surface depth. We should be talking about the interior volume because floor mounted hoods are, have a larger interior volume than a bench mounted hood. So now we're talking about air changes per hour. And they said that a range between 150 and 375 air changes per hour is typical and probably adequate. But we say caution. That minimum flow is hood and system dependent. So you have to be very careful about selecting that minimum flow. To test the minimum flow and see if this range of variation is appropriate, you look at the VAV response and stability test. There's two methods. You can take a signal right off the control valve itself, or you can put the velocity anemometer right in the bottom slot of the baffle. That velocity in that bottom slot is directly proportional to flow. So when you raise and lower the sash, you can see we're at our minimum flow, it's stable, we raise the sash, we get our speed of response, it's stable when the sash is open, and we can go through three cycles of doing that, open and closed, open and closed, and that tells you that the VAV control is operating properly. When you see flow fluctuations, you're gonna see poor containment. And that means that the system may not be tuned properly. And it may be a controller issue. It might be a static pressure control system wide issue. So we have to be able to identify and diagnose the problems and conduct this test on a routine basis, not just during commissioning, but routinely, because that's what's going to drive the energy savings. So now, let's scale it up from the hood and look at the building automation system. So as we know, as test and balancers and commissioning agents, our job is to validate that this information on the BAS is correct. And there's a lot of faith put in these numbers. And the faith not only starts at the day that we say it's turned over to the customer, but over time. And decisions, management decisions will be made on this information. So the question is, how confident are we that this information is correct and that it's staying calibrated? Well, this is a plot of face velocities for a facility, and we can see that our, here's our expected range, 90 to 110, and on this sample period, we had them all over the place. So looking at this from a facility-wide perspective, in just one sample period, we see a tremendous amount of variation. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means it may have started out properly commissioned and properly tuned, but for some reason, there was a change. And when that change occurred, we would issue a work order and they would come in and they would fix that problem. But the fume hoods are tested annually. Who tests the general exhaust and the supply? So if you have this kind of failure rate on the fume hood exhaust, wouldn't you anticipate some failure rate on the general exhaust and the supply? So how do we incorporate those into the overall program? Here's a plot of the VAV terminals on the supply. And this is what we call a lab environment test. So we're looking at We'd like to have a range of plus or minus 10%, but we're seeing lots of terminals get well outside of that range. When that occurs, our room pressurization is affected. If sufficient number of spaces are out of compliance, then the building pressurization is affected. So we have to make sure that we're looking at testing those on a more frequent basis to make sure that they're A, initially tested correctly and commissioned, and then they're being tested on some periodic basis and validate that the work or the information provided by the building automation system is appropriate. So we get into our concepts of accuracy and precision. If we're accurate and precise, we've got that information that right on the bullseye, right where it's supposed to be. At that EPA RTP facility, they're again using 48% of the entire energy of the portfolio of buildings for EPA. We found when we did our initial study, 
20 to 65 percent error in the controls. Now that means all of the information being reported back to the building automation system was suspect. Could we use it for anything? So we had to go through this LVOP process, the ventilation optimization process. We retuned everything. We got it within 5 percent error. Now we can start making management decisions on how the systems were operating. What our data indicates is that VAV systems can degrade of 30 to 50 percent within the first five years. And that's because the attention to the maintenance is not being done and the adequate tests are not being applied to make sure that they're staying in uh, calibration. We also found through this that there are issues associated with the controls themselves. This is a typical commercial grade VAV box. Internally it has the components, pressure transducer, damper actuator and so forth. And what we found is this pressure transducer, this commercial grade transducer is junk. It doesn't work very well. It has very low sensitivity. You get down to 300 CFM, it really starts to lose sensitivity. So what we said was, why not take a high precision pressure transducer and put it on there and replace the, just work it out of the system, work the old transducer out of the system. So by upgrading this box with a new transducer, a new pressure uh, damper actuator, we got tremendously better performance out of this commercial grade box. And the information was more reliable coming back to the system. So now we've got the operating conditions set. Let's move to the testing, the performance. We want to generate visible smoke in the hood and look at the airflow patterns. We know that the airflow patterns will be distributed in the hood. There might be a vortex region. When a person stands in front of the hood, we're going to get flow eddies. And so the purpose of the smoke is to look at where are these airflow patterns going? How do we optimize the baffle configuration? How do we create a more, uh, an environment that's more conducive to containment? And you can begin to rate this. A failure is when you see escape of smoke past the plane of the sash. A pour is you might see reverse flow within the first six inches of the opening, but not necessarily escape outside of the hood. A fair is where you see reverse flow, but mainly that's in the vortex region, but you get good flow when the sash is open. And then a good is no reverse flow at all. It just flows through the hood like a, a piston. All right, so that's an easy way to kind of evaluate quantitatively, qualitatively assess performance. The public works said there's too much variability in the way to generate smoke. So they said let's use a di uh, diffuser, let's use a fog generator that controls the distribution of the smoke so that we have a uniform source, generates a uniform concentration of smoke out of the plume, and then we can qualitatively assess it. But every technician doing the testing generates it in exactly the same way. And that has gone a long ways toward creating a uniform evaluation of hood containment. Our initial tests indicate that this test, when using a mannequin, is almost as sensitive as a tracer gas test, but it is a lot cheaper. Moving to the quantitative test, we have the tracer gas test. We generate the gas in the mannequin in the, inside the hood, pull the breathing zone samples, and we measure at the left, the center, and the right side of the hood. All of that information is collecting at a reading per second through a data acquisition system. And then you take that five minute average determine that it's, in this case, four liters per minute as manufactured, less than 0.05 parts per million. The Z95 standard says for an as installed or as used test, it can be 0.1 parts per million, and that's the pass-fail criteria for the tracer gas test. <coughs> so now, moving from the hood <coughs> up to the, uh, to the laboratory. So we know, we've now checked out the hood. We know that we've got appropriate flow modulation on the hood side, but we then have to match that to the supply side. So we've got more components to take a look at. From the supply side, we've got our max and min, we've got some transfer air volume. We'd like that transfer air volume to be constant at minimum and maximum, and that will maintain a consistent differential pressure. An easy check is to look at differential pressure across the, chain, the range of modulation. So if you have the sash open and the sash closed, if that differential pressure does not remain the same, the supply is not tracking it properly, or the general exhaust, one of the two. But you're getting a variance in the transfer air volume just using differential pressure. Then the question is the dilution of air within that space. What's the minimum air change rate? And if you change the flow through this diffuser, we're going to affect the terminal velocity. We're going to affect the airflow diffusion within the space. 
and that may impact temperature control. So we've got a lot of factors to evaluate on the lab level, and we call this the lab environment test. We look at the hood first, then check the flow through the system, look at the differential pressure, look at temperature control, and once we're sure that it's operating effectively, then we move on to the next space. Now this question about air changes per hour is a difficult one. There are a lot of guidelines, they're circular, they start, ASHRAE says 4 to 12 air changes per hour, OSHA recommends 4 to 12 air changes per hour, but the ACGIH and the American Industrial Hygiene Association says that a prescriptive air change per hour is not appropriate. It has to be based on the space and the type of work that's going on in that space because it's there for dilution. So if we pick out a prescriptive number like 6 or 8 or 10, that may not be directly applicable to each space. So we have to make sure we understand what are the factors that drive that selection. So we have the emissions in the lab. What's the emission scenario? We have escape from the lab hoods, improper benchtop procedures. In each case, you may have a rise in accumulation, and then when it runs out of material, it'll begin to decay. And so we have to look at what is that potential generation? Is it 0.1 liters per minute or up to 10 liters per minute? In the ASHRAE test, we're generating four liters per minute. To give you a range, one liter per minute is like a normal rate of evaporation. Eight liters per minute is like a rapid rate of boiling. So four liters per minute was chosen to be kind of in between. If you're generating four liters per minute outside of a hood, you're going to have a problem with, containment, with uh, dilution. There is no way that four to 12 air change per hour is going to minimize those concentrations below some permissible exposure limit. So we have to be careful about what we're trying to control with dilution. And then you have the accidental spill. There's no way you can control for that. If you have a gas cylinder that's going to discharge its entire contents, it, the valve breaks off and it just releases, you're going to get 1,400 liters per minute. So there's no way you're going to control that with an air change rate. You simply have to evacuate the lab. So the air change rate does not equate to safety. What it does equate to are how much airflow do you need. And it equates to temperature control. So with this, we developed a control banding approach. And working with the University of California and Irvine, Clemson University, and the Medical University of South Carolina, we developed a, a way to weight the uh, laboratories. And we evaluate each laboratory in terms of their hazards, in terms of the uh, exposure control devices, and the other parameters around the lab, and we decide, assign a scoring. And with that scorecard, we can then assign control bands. So a control band, the lowest hazard, you can go less than four air changes per hour. You can probably recirculate that air. And the pressurization is not critical. Conversely, if you have a category five, it's where you're working with immediately dangerous to life and health materials, chemical warfare agents, things of that nature, you're going to want to go with at least 10 air changes per hour, absolutely no recirculation. And then you want to have physical isolation of that space and critical monitoring. So you can now lay this out on a map and look at the areas within this facility where this is really applicable. And that means that those have to be tested on an annualized basis and the commissioning becomes that much more critical initially. Because that sets the benchmarks. So when we select air change rates, we want to survey the labs, establish the hazards, the sources, what kind of exposure control devices, where are the supply diffusers and the airflow effectiveness, determine our emission scenario, apply the control bands, determine the minimum ACH. From the room volume, we get the airflow specifications. So it's a derived number. It's a process. You can see that they obviously thought they had a problem with exposure here and built their own hood. So how many people have seen things like that? <laughs> right? Very common. How do you establish the airflow specifications for that device? You know, it's really not appropriate. In this case, they had all this stuff going on on the bench top. So there was no way you could create enough flow through that space to, to minimize the concentrations of exposure. So those have to be moved into a fume hood or some type of ventilated device. And so that's what kind of differentiates when you're looking at the lab from the survey standpoint. So now we've looked at the hood and we've looked at the lab environment. We know that energy savings require flow reduction at the air handlers and the exhaust fans. They are the energy consumers. And so if we don't get a commensurate reduction in flow at those units, there is no net energy savings. We can calculate it all day long and say, sash open to closed, 500 CFM reduction, 500 times five is $2,500 a year. 
But if that 500 CFM does not translate to the air handlers, there is not the same net energy reduction. When we look at this, we have to establish the minimum maximum flow that we anticipate over the range of operating modes. And then look at what is the VAV sensitivity. Now, how many folks here test that? Start with all the sashes closed, evaluate this minimum, and then open all the sashes and see if you modulate to the maximum. Is that part of the typical conditioning test? Maybe. Right? So what I'm proposing is that it become part of the typical commissioning test. And once you've challenged it, then you know what it is. And that sets the basis for all subsequent routine tests. <clears throat> you've got your outside air bypass dampers, VFDs. You can tell how old this slide is. <laughs> Pretty big VFD. Um, <clears throat> Well, the issue here is that we have some metrics. We have the, the speed of the drive. We have the position of the damper. How many times when we're testing this system do we record the position of the outside air bypass damper? So that when we're at minimum flow, that should be at max. And when we're at max flow, it should be closed. And we now have a correlation. We should be able to correlate the position of that damper with the flow or the operating mode. And if we have that correlation, then the building automation system can tell us a lot of information about how is the system operating. So if we said, if all sashes were closed, this damper is 100% open, then we know they're at the sash closed position, minimum flow. However, if we were able to see the damper at 50%, we should anticipate that the utilization is around 50%. So if we were to able to extract sash positions, we could do a correlation. And that allows us to drive back into the system and see some information that allows us to compare our expected operation to actual. Let's look at this expected operation. Surely you've seen this kind of system. The distribution is on the exhaust side. We've got fume hoods, general exhaust, the terminals. We've got a exhaust fan system. It may have VFDs, may have outside air bypass dampers, may have a combination of those two. On the supply side, we've got a distributed network of VAV terminals, static pressure control, maybe there's total flow measurement, maybe there's a VFD on that as well. All this information goes back to the building automation system. So our first route of thing is we say, okay, this hood, when it opens and closes, we have some range of modulation. And let's say that modulation is from 200 CFM to 1,000. So we're gonna say when the sash is closed, it's a 200, it's open, it's 1,000, 800 CFM of modulation. On the general exhaust, it might be closed, when the sash is open and open when the sash is closed. And so that might be a range of modulation of 500. Well now what we can do with these numbers is we can add them up and we can say all the sash is closed, our total flow should be some number. All sash is open, our total flow should be some number. And then by measuring it, both on the supply and exhaust, we can then compare it. We can compare our expected, our predicted operation to the actual. And then we look at if we modulate each one in series, we should see a commensurate rise in flow through the system or a closure of the damper. Should be a stair step effect. What happens then is we look at this range of modulation. In this case, it's 5600 CFM. The question is, if we opened each one of these sequentially, we, we had them all closed, we opened this, and three minutes later we opened this one, and three minutes later we opened this one, we should see a stair step increase in flow through the system. And it should be exactly as we predict. That would be a VAV sensitivity of 100%. But if that modulation is not what we expect, then it may be lower. We're seeing lots of systems that when we test the VAV sensitivity, we're seeing 70 and 80%, which means 20 to 30% of the hoods actually have to open before we see the first increment in flow reduction or flow increase. A lot of systems four to five years, five, 10 years later, zero percent, meaning you can open and close the sashes all day long, but you're not getting any modulation at the air handlers and the exhaust fans. Net energy savings, zero. And it's happening all over the place. And the reason is that once the commissioning is over, if it were commissioned and done properly, who is connect, who's taking the next step and doing it on a routine basis and testing this system next year? The fume hoods get tested annually, the general exhaust do not, the supply do not. 
So let's say that you open this first hood and the general exhaust down the row is not operating. So all of that flow that you recovered from the hood being closed just bypasses to the dysfunctional general exhaust box adjacent to it or down the row. The static pressure sensor, you're expecting that the static pressure sensor on the, say the supply, when you close this sash, the static pressure is going to go up. But if this box is functioning but this box is not functioning, it'll attenuate the static pressure. So the static pressure will no longer be commensurate with that rise or change in flow at that hood. It just washes it out, makes the system soft and unresponsive. So with Lawrence Berkeley, we developed what we call the system operating mode test. And with this test, we define the operating modes, sashes closed, sashes open, occupied, unoccupied, and we measure the total flow and static pressure over the range of this boundary conditions. We also trend the building automation system, and then we can compare our measured values to the reported values. That gives a good correlation there. But we can also record the terminal boxes. If we have the capability of recording the flow set points the flow at each terminal, the damper percentage, we can see the distribution of the dampers on that duct. Now, as we know from our balancing experience, the dampers closest to the fan are probably most closed, and the dampers all the way at the end of the system are probably most open. And if we don't see that kind of distribution when we do this plot, then we know there's an issue. So you can begin to look at this distribution. You can pull these values out. You can look at the change between sashes closed and sashes open, and then look at sash height, sashes closed, we're at the flow set points, here's our damper percentages, and then when we open that hood, we see the change in flow and see the change in damper percentage. And that's an easy way to begin looking at the operation of the system. You can also compare total flow between occupied and unoccupied. In this case, we're going to set our boundary conditions. We're going to say at minimum flow we're here, at maximum flow we're here. When we do this test, we should see the full range of modulation as expected. In this case, this is a building that during the day, the supply flow was exceeding the exhaust, and so they were wasting a lot of energy. At night, the, supply, the exhaust flow was dramatically exceeding the supply, putting the whole building under negative pressure. Now, in North Carolina, similar to Texas, or similar to Las Vegas, at night, you're going to get a cooler, more humid outside air, which is being drawn into the building. And then during the day, as the AC comes on, guess what? It begins to rain inside the building. All that moisture condenses out. So by doing this test, we are very quickly identified the imbalance in the building air supply, and then we can drive down into the individual terminals and assess, is it a problem at a system level or at a terminal level? And that, just this one test, gives us the ability to diagnose it. So this was written up in a um, best practices guide for I2SL. It's on their website, Labs of the 21st Century I2SL website. We also can look at static pressure in the building. Looking at real-time measurement of static pressure across the out exterior doors, we can look at a trend. And here, looking at it over time, we begin to see that the building pressurization is fluctuating over time. And as we look at that, why it's occurring, it's occurring because the, the flow control is not appropriate at minimum and maximum. There's a difference in error so when the boxes are at minimum flow, maybe they're 10% error, maybe they're 50% error. And when they're at high flow and full cooling, they might be at a different percentage error. And it depends on how that box is calibrated. If it uses one flow coefficient, was that coefficient set at the high flow or at the low flow or as an aggregate average between the two points? If it's a two-point flow coefficient, then maybe you can get them exactly right on both ends. So that incurs a lot of, or introduces error in the system if we can't get that calibration proper over the range. Now also looking at reducing flow, we have to look at reentrainment and make sure that the stack discharge is sufficient to prevent accumulation on the roof, exposure to people working on the roof, or pulling back into the air supply system. So we were working at a facility uh, at NIOSH, which is the research division of OSHA. And I was giving a speech similar to this and talking about reentrainment. And uh, the maintenance guys were laughing. And I said, well, what's so funny? They said, well, when we work on the roof, we can always tell um, when they're working with acids because our skin gets all prickly. 
I said, that, that's a sign. That's uh, Bill Engvall. There's your sign, you know. Um, and they said, yeah, they wanted us to put a guardrail up over the stack. A guardrail? What in the world for? He said, well, you're going to have to come see. So we walked up on the roof, and they had the fans in the penthouse, but the, the stacks terminated at the roof of the penthouse. And their fear was that if you were walking along the roof, you'd fall in the stack. So they had them put a guardrail up around that. I said, well, wait a minute. This is a real problem. You've got to get those stacks up higher. So looking at discharge height, uh, ANSI Z95 says 10 feet above the highest structure on the roof, 3,000 feet per minute, or whatever is appropriate to prevent reentrainment. So kind of uh, using my last few minutes here, um, <clears throat> The, pro the process was developed to help facilities identify these issues and plan and execute projects to help improve safety and reduce energy consumption. And so it's called the lab ventilation optimization process. And essentially, it includes a lab safety and energy assessment. It's very low cost. We evaluate and assess the building. From there, you move to the engineering project, which is the engineer and implement tab and recommission the systems. And then finally, there's the ventilation management plan, which says here's how you're going to keep them operating effectively for the long term. With this assessment, we began developing a profile. And we profile the buildings. And we profile them as A, B, C, D, or an E. An A building has a high opportunity for energy reduction with a very quick payback. A D building has lots of infrastructure issues, lots of requirements. The payback period goes out big time. It's a very complex project. An E building has no or uh, negligible opportunities. Once you determine the opportunities, you move to the engineering project. So you have to determine the operating specs, you have to upgrade the systems and do the modifications, and you have to develop a tab and commissioning plan. Then you move to the actual project where you implement those performance improvement measures and the energy conservation measures and verify performance and energy savings. So at the EPA, we went from no modulation, we reduced the flow, and then we got the systems to modulate. And so by doing that, we saved them 46% of their energy consumption. So there's a roadmap. Every customer will go through this roadmap. It starts with them establishing their goals, their initiatives, their funding availability. We call it the Rapid Energy and Lab Safety Assessment. You can call it whatever you want. It's basically an energy audit, ASHRAE 1, Level 1, or Level 2. Once that, you select the ECMs, you develop your project scope of work, Align the funding sources. We do a lot of work in New England. New England will, will fund 50%. The utilities will fund 50% of the energy projects. So of our study and the execution. So we just did a project. It was $1.5 million for the University of Massachusetts. We retrofitted all the fume hoods. We upgraded them from traditional hoods to high performance. And then we um, installed a, an air monitoring system. And we saved them $600,000 a year. The utilities paid 50% of it. So the payback period on it was a year and a half. Right? And those programs are available in states throughout the United States. So, uh, but it all depends on the utility. From this, we move to the engineering project. And you can see every one of these requires tab and commissioning. Every single project. The LVMP follows with the ventilation management, routine test and maintenance. Every one of them, there's a value, there's a payback. There are 11,000 laboratory buildings in the United States. Combined, they're, they're consuming $7.5 billion worth of energy. This process will get 20 to 30% energy savings on average. So when you start thinking about the numbers, they're immense. And every one of those requires tab and commissioning. The profiling, <clears throat> as I mentioned, an A building, it's less than a three-year payback, B building, five-year, C, 10, D greater than 10. The difference in an A building is it requires some minor engineering to reprogram the flow specifications, some component repairs, tab, and commissioning. The B building, you start to get a little more extensive. We can do fume hood retrofits. We can upgrade components, install VAV controls, again, tab, and commissioning. The C building, five to 10-year payback, now you're getting into major engineering, you're doing fan upgrades, manifolding exhaust fans, creating different ductwork configurations, new components, tab and commissioning. In your D buildings, these projects take years. D buildings are extensive projects that go out to bid. They're tough to control. They're difficult to fund. 
but they're big projects. They're major engineering, big component replacements, and so forth. So we start with the A and B buildings, show a facility we can save them money. We work with local, regional providers of these services so that everybody gets involved. And once we develop a team, we roll through the buildings. And it's worked very, very successfully. In fact, we've done 40 or 50 buildings with this process. This is just a short subset of it, going from flow measurements before to after. We're saving on average 30%, reducing their flow requirements on an annualized basis. At four and a half dollars a CFM year, we're saving $3.1 million just in these buildings here. Right? Over the course of this, we've done now four or five million square feet of lab space in this process, and the energy savings are in the tens of millions of dollars. And so in each area of the country, we've been working with our partners and uh, developing this process to execute. And those include engineering firms, they include test and balance firms, they include commissioning firms. And so it's executing this process so that the facilities can operate effectively now and effectively in the future. So I'll go through quickly. The next step is the lab ventilation management program. We get the energy down. So in this case, at EPA, 70 billion BTUs. How do you keep it that way? So you implement a ventilation management program. It says, here's how we're going to organize. We're going to have standard operating procedures for testing. We're going to put in ventilation standards, and we're going to help with management of change and train the personnel. There's lots of inefficiencies in the maintenance process. When people test fume hoods, they typically find a problem and issue a work order. Those work orders might indicate a problem with an exhaust fan or maybe an air handler or something like that. Then you have to get into diagnostics and determine what's wrong and so forth. Well, we said, why not just change the process just a little bit? Let's start with the air handlers and exhaust fans first. Let's get those operating correctly. Then we do the system operating mode tests to make sure the controls are functioning and we have our variability. Then we do the lab environment tests and the fume hood tests. And so the sequential process then helps to more effectively utilize their resources and their maintenance efforts. So again, we're saving them money and time on the back end as well. And this can be implemented anywhere and for any of your customers. And then, of course, you use the building automation system to monitor that over time because the information has high quality and high validity. And then finally, you've got to train the people because you can idiot-proof it, but you can't PhD-proof it. So that brings us to the end. Um, are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. How do you have a chemical company that has set a maximum high air change per hour restriction on their new designs? Um, and what I originally thought was they were trying to do it for energy savings, but really they're doing it because they believe um, they would have containment issues in the human in these spaces. It used to be like R&D level Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've we've published a number of those studies, okay. and uh, in fact, we're working with the University of California right now. They had installed air acuity systems, mm -hmm. right? You may be familiar with those. Yep. And the question was, how do they justify going to lower, you know, two or four air changes per hour? Mm -hmm. And so, what we've developed is a the control banding approach to look at the lab hazard, the risk assessment. And then we've developed a dilution test where we can actually evaluate the dilution effectiveness within the space. And that helps to establish the appropriate range of air changes. So I think, I think that covers the low side. I think what they're saying is that once you have so much airflow within the lab space itself that it's going to create currents in front of the fume hood and affect the phase velocity there. So they're arbitrarily limited to a number, and I didn't know yeah, 20 would be low in that case. What, where, the, where the problems really come into play is you have a, a required amount of square footage per hood and supply diffuser area per hood opening area. So you've got these metrics, right, two to one type of thing. Where you really get into problems where those cross traps start approaching 50% of the average space velocity, where we have an absolute hard cutoff of 60 air changes per hour. Okay. At, at above that, you really have problems. You cannot introduce the air into the space in such a way that you're going to minimize those drafts. But it's 60, not 20. It's that's 60, not 20. Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah. Right, 
absolutely. Yes, sir. The question is, uh, when you're doing commissioning and you're doing the uh, face velocity test, in your specs, is it you're providing it, is the commission provider to provide the equipment, or are you overseeing the testing for that specific test? Okay, so if you look at the ordering of who provides the specifications, that, that doesn't necessarily need to be the commissioning authority or the agent, right? It should be the engineer of record. Now, everybody can collaborate on that. And ultimately, health and safety is the ones that are responsible internally for that decision. And the engineer of record then holds the requirement or the, the, the legal responsibility. So the actual testing, who's going to bring the certified equipment to the face velocity test that they can do with the commission provider? It should be the commission provider, correct. Do you also see projects where the contractor does that and the commission has oversight for that? Because there are a lot of commission firms that don't carry the uh, certified equipment. Sure, yeah, it can be operated a whole bunch of ways. We're not a certificate, we're not a commissioning company. We will support those efforts. We're an industrial hygiene consultant, right? So that's our role, ECT. Right, but the, um, uh, if the commissioning authority or agent is then oversight, providing oversight, their responsibility in my mind is to make sure that the data is collected appropriately and that they're following the plan. If it's provided by a contractor that has the certified equipment, so be it, that's okay, as long as the information they collect has been validated and is appropriate for the, for the building. And the last question is, what is the norm? The norm is to have a certifier do the testing that maintains their own certifications, whether it be NSF or NEB or what have you, for doing the testing, and then the commissioning agent actually provides the validation and makes sure that they're following the appropriate procedures and does the information documentation. That's how we see it as a norm. Yep. Yes, ma'am. It should be every single time. Yeah. You sh every hood should be as installed, tested with uh, face velocity, cross draft smoke. BAV response and tracer gas, every single hood. Yes, sir. The lead is not good enough, in my opinion. There are no standards for commissioning labs. The ADZ 9.5 has commissioning recommendations. And ASHRAE also has lab commissioning recommendations, but there are no, quote, standards that are available at this moment that I'm aware of. If the lab test goes back and says, we'll just do the minimum lead fundamental commissioning, is that the lead that would be responsible for the commissioning agent for some of the equipment? It may be the legal requirement, but I would say it's woefully inadequate because let's look at what the building's there for. The building is there to meet the functional requirements of the researchers. It's, they've made a significant investment in that building. If they don't know that it operates effectively from the start, how are they going to ensure the lab environment is conducive to high quality research? So it's in their best interest to make sure that it's properly commissioned to begin with and that they understand its operation and have defined that over the range of operating modes so that they can maintain it. If they don't do that, then they're selling themselves short and they're not going to provide that return on investment. That's how we see it. So it's not a legal requirement. It's a, um, it's a, it's a safety requirement for sure, but it's also a requirement just from a financial sense. I think we're, we're a little sh coming towards the end here. Maybe one more question. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Well, this process, for one, is something that we're rolling out through the Department of Energy. But air acuity is a good system for integrating that. And there's also retrofit kits for fume hoods that can make a traditional hood operate as a high performance hood. And you can lower the face velocity from 100 to 60 feet per minute. And so I have a division in my company that actually sells a retrofit kit. And um, it's easy to install. And so a certified installer can install it in two to three hours and uh, get a very significant payback. Yes, sir? Yeah, 
Yeah, the three and fours are a little bit difficult because you really have to get into the laboratory environment. It's unique to those facilities. So it depends on the types of materials we're working with, the type of processes. So that control bands are really established for each individual facility, and they're manipulated based on the health and safety, their tolerance for risk. So there's a number of factors involved. So it's not a hard and fast line. Is there a reference I can refer to that? We, we, we presented it at the I2SL Labs 21 conference last year. And we're working on presentation or a publication now. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure, absolutely. Thank you very much for your time and attention.